Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. I want to thank Mr. Hueso and his staff for a thoughtful analysis of my bill. And I want to thank Senator McGuire and Senator Bradford for serving as co-authors. AB 920 helps California meet its clean energy goals in a way that is more reliable for our grid and more sustainable for our communities. This bill requires retail sellers of energy to produce balanced renewable portfolios that include an appropriate mix of baseload resources like geothermal and biomass. The Geysers Geothermal Facility is in my district and it provides hundreds of critically important high quality jobs in one of the most impoverished regions in the state. Biomass facilities serve as a vital in part point for mountains of organic waste coming out of the ag lands, forests, and urban areas that would otherwise be burned or sent to a landfill. This bill reinforces the value of baseload renewable resources to ensure that they continue to serve the environment, environmental, energy, and economic needs of California. I respectfully ask for your I vote, and I have I test people to testify today as well. Okay, very well. If you want to, yeah. yeah. Good morning, uh, Honorable Chairman Ben Wesso and members of the committee. My name is Emmanuel Martinez with the Imperial. Irrigation District, thank you for the time and I want to thank uh, uh, Ms. Curry for carrying this bill, uh, AB 920, which is significantly important to uh, elevating the geothermal resources that IID has in its backyard. Uh, by way of background, IID is a publicly owned utility located in the southeastern uh, corner of the state. IID is the third largest public power a utility provider in the state in terms of the amount of energy it delivers. Uh, it's one of eight balancing authorities here in the state of California and has a, a transmission network that includes 1,400 miles of high voltage lines and we serve approximately 450,000 people in our service area. Uh, IID has met our, its RPS obligation, sourcing those resources locally within our, within our backyard. We're very proud to say that uh, we resource our small hydro, solar, and geothermal, uh, all in, within our service territory. And AB 920, uh, what it does for us is elevates the geo untapped geothermal potential that we have at the Salton Sea. According to various studies, there's approximately 1,700 to 2,000 megawatts of untapped ge geothermal potential at the Salton Sea. And we think this resource is very important to helping meet the state's RPS and GHG goals, uh, at the same time creating in-state jobs. Uh, geothermal is also one of the few technologies that provides uh, property tax revenue for a local county, uh, which aids in helping to provide local economic development at the regional level. Um, and not only is this resource important uh, for IID in terms of providing a reliable, diverse uh, portfolio for the state, uh, it's also very important for the IID in terms of the environmental crisis that is looming at the Salton Sea. Uh, the Salton Sea is, uh, at the end of this year, 2017, gonna lose mitigation water. So we know that it's gonna be receding at a very accelerated rate. Uh, studies have shown that by the year 2030, approximately 50,000 acres of exposed playa are gonna be uh, uh, susceptible to windblown dust. We know that we have some of the highest asthma, childhood asthma hospitalization rates in the state within the IID uh, service territory. So we know that this bill, not only does it help provide a reliable, diverse portfolio for the state, it also provides significant co-benefits for us as it relates to environmental benefits. We have 400 avian species that stop at the Salton Sea uh, on their way uh, up north due, uh, in the Pacific Flyway. We know it's also gonna help meet the state's GHG and RPS goals. Uh, it's a diverse balanced portfolio, as mentioned, that's the least cost and best fit. Um, and it's appropriate mix of renewable capacity, uh, including peak dispatchable, baseload firm resource. So all these non-energy benefits are also very important to us. And that's how we think about it in the context of AB 920. So I just wanna thank Senator Ben Wessel for all his work uh, that he's done, uh, not only as it relates to energy issues, but also the salt and sea. And there is a nexus there. I wanna take, thank Ms. Weir Curry for her bill, AB 920, and we urge your strong support for this measure. So we're also here to answer any questions. Thank you. And ma'am? Thank you. Uh, Kelly Boyd on behalf of uh, Greenleaf Power, the state's largest biomass company. Uh, thank you, Chairman Hueso and committee. We want to thank the author for uh, introducing the bill. Um, 
Baseload and flexible renewables are, are going to be key to balancing our grid and bridging our grid as more uh, fossil fuel baseload comes offline uh, going forward. Um, Greenleaf has three plants in California. We have 154 total megawatts. Some of that is outside California. We're in key centers to receive forest, agricultural, and landfill waste. Uh, we displace a significant amount of particulate matter, um, which is huge in the Central Valley, in addition to carbon emissions. Um, Greenleaf's facility in Tracy was closed two years ago uh, and is no longer receiving agricultural and landfill materials. During that time period, the um, open burn permits in the area have gone up by 400% and the recyclers who bring um, the waste from the Bay Area are, are no longer able to bring it to our facility. So that also uh, emits into the air. Um, we we um, also note that while resources like geothermal and biomass may be a little bit um, higher cost just on a commodity basis, there are much lower overall cost to the grid. You don't have to upgrade distribution or transmission. We're already interconnected um, from a carbon footprint. We're embedded in the ground or we're going to be uh, placed in areas that are very strategic. So we, uh, we urge passage of this measure and we, we wish uh, it did more at this time. I'm going to have to cut you off because you're stealing all my talking points here. I, I, I have some things I want to say. Too, I'm so but. sorry. I would never do that. <laughs> I'm joking. We have uh, Assembly Member Garcia here as well. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. I think much has been said, but I'll point to page six of uh, nine page analysis that your staff has uh, put forward. And I'll read um, uh, verbatim, the CPUC procurement process is poorly able, may be unable to accurately value these energy benefits. And we've talked about the baseload uh, opportunities, the job creation uh, at the same time, you know, some of the existing opportunities that uh, this renewable energy diversification uh, brings forward to the state. Um, it also uh, states that the legislative process, however, is not. Uh, the legislature may just uh, such a evaluation last year as it relates to the biomass and approve the biomass procurement mandate. If the legislature knows the degree to which it values combined attributes of renewable uh, baseload resources, uh, perhaps we may want to be very specific to the CPUC. Uh, and so I just wanted to thank you, your committee. I think they highlight exactly uh, what direction we ought to be taking, and perhaps this is one step closer, but uh, we will continue to work with these stakeholders to ensure that we get to, uh, to steal a word from the Senate Pro Tem with direct intentionality of what we're trying to accomplish here. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, uh, supporters? Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Julie Malinowski Ball on behalf of the California Biomass Energy Alliance. On behalf of the thousands of employees at the facilities, the truck drivers who move this material around the state, the chippers, the grinders uh, who take the fuel out of the fields and out of the forest and away from the landfills for landfill diversion, uh, you know that you're getting a three to five, three to five jobs per megawatt when you procure biomass energy. Uh, and we think that's a, a co-benefit that the RPS program needs to elevate here, and we support this bill and ask for your I vote. Faith Lane with California Advocates here today for the Almond Alliance of California in support. Jan Money Jones with the Independent Energy Producers, who represent pretty much one of everybody in the renewable community, and uh, we support this bill. Uh, and to answer the question, actually to follow up in Mr. Garcia's perspe uh, 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 perspective here, it is very important to continue to remind the PUC that their job is to continue to have a balanced resource portfolio. Uh, so far, we've not, uh, they have moved that direction. They have the resources to do it, and we think that this bill would help reinforce the idea that they should be taking that very seriously. Thank you. Senator Rhonda Mills with the Geothermal Energy Association uh, to pile onto what Mr. Smutney Jones just said. Uh, the problem at the PUC is that they don't model our technologies, uh, they don't model our uh, non-energy benefits, so we get sort of short, uh, the short shrift over there in procurement. That's why we really liked Ms. Curry's original bill. Um, it gave very clear direction on what was going to happen. We look forward to working with the body. We hope that it gets strengthened back up. Thank you. Good morning, Julia Levin with the Bioenergy Association of California. We represent more than 60 public agencies, local governments, and private companies working to convert organic waste to energy. 
I think the National Academy of Sciences said it best. A couple of weeks ago, they released a paper by 21 energy experts from around the country saying we cannot get to our long-term or mid-century renewable energy goals without bioenergy, geothermal, and other forms of flexible generation and baseload renewables. We simply cannot do it with solar and wind and storage alone. And this bill sends a very strong message to the PUC to start looking at the broader portfolio. So we strongly support the bill. Mr. Chairman, members, Josh Pane, on behalf of the California Refuse Recycling Council, 125 solid waste recycling companies throughout the state. We presently have thousands of tons of biomass material building up. We can't take it to the landfill because of our commitment not to put uh, this organic matter in the landfill. So this is one of our answers. We appreciate the author's work, the chairman's work, and we'd like to strengthen the bill even more and tell the PUC that 20 percent is a bare minimum that should happen on the biomass. Thank you. Julia Kingsley representing CERC Energy in support, and we align ourselves with the comments made by the Geothermal Energy Association. Um, I'm also representing today in support the California Compost Coalition, as well as the Alameda County Waste Management Authority. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning. My name is Jim Turner. I'm the General Manager of Controlled Thermal Resources, and I'd like to associate myself with the comments of the Chair and the Committee members. This bill is a great start, but we should move diligently towards strengthening the proposal. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to briefly discuss in the next two minutes how the development of the Salton Sea's geothermal resources will help mitigate the effects of the Salton Sea's impending collapse. Controlled Thermal Resource is currently developing the Hell's Kitchen Geothermal Power Plant, a 280 megawatt facility on the southeast corner of the Salton Sea. In addition to creating over 500 construction and operating jobs, plus a uh, multitude of other indirect jobs in one of the poorest parts of the state, the facility will provide invaluable co-benefit along with substantial property taxes. Using a dust mitigation strategy outlined in the IID Salt and Sea Air Mitigation Program and working with Bruce Wilcox of the state, uh, controlled thermal resources will build this power plant and three additional facilities on exposed playa suppressing dust emissions. Controlled thermal resources will co-locate with habitat restoration projects, providing the needed infrastructure to get these projects built quickly and cost effectively. From the perspective of the state's electric grid, salt and sea geothermal power plants such as ours will enhance both grid stability and reliability through its rotating inertia. The addition of these power facilities is imperative if we are to continue the push towards clean air and a reliable and stable electric grid. Finally, through an innovative agreement with IID, controlled thermal resources will generate significant royalties. These are dollars that could be used to help offset the cost of restoring the sea and mitigating the effects of the sea's collapse and multi-billion dollar liability the state is financially on the hook for under the QSA. But none of this is possible without a robust legislative approach to ensuring clean inertia producing baseload resources uh, that are taken seriously by the state. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, members, Chris McKaylee on behalf of the Humboldt Redwood Company and Mendocino Redwood Company in support. Kirsten Kolpitke with the California Forestry Association, also on behalf of the California Farm Bureau Federation in support. Hi, Jeffrey Harmon on behalf of Desert View Power and HL Power in support of the bill. Thank you. Hi, Vince Warat Majo with the Weidman Group on behalf of IHI Power and its five biomass plants in support. Good morning, Cassandra Goff on behalf of Calpine. Thank you to the authors and the numerous co-authors in the room uh, in support and hoping that as we expand the pie, we can even do something more. Thank you. Jody Hicks on behalf of Covanta Energy in support. Sylvia Solis Shaw on behalf of the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District, the Solid Waste Association of North America, and Kern County all in support. Um, also on behalf of Sonoma, the Board of Supervisors of Sonoma County, they have a support and concept position as they would like to see language um, that would describe how this program would be integrated with CCAs. So we'll continue to talk to the author's office about that. We ask for your support. Thank you. Barbara Levake on behalf of California Women for Agriculture and the Sacramento Valley Landowners Association in support. 
Mr. Chairman and members, Jarrett Blanion on behalf of the California Low Carbon Fuel and Energy Coalition and strong support, and thanks to the author. Twainer. Mr. Chairman and members, uh, Scott Witch on behalf of the California State Pipe Trades Council, the State Association of Electrical Workers, and the Coalition of Utility Employees in strong support, and would like to thank the Chair for his longstanding work uh, on behalf of this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members, Jason Eichert with Edelstein, Gilbert, Robeson, and Smith on behalf of the California Community Choice Association, Cal CCA, which represents all eight of the operational uh, community choice electricity providers in California. Very briefly, we're, we're neutral on the bill, which is really a testament to the hard work the author and her staff put into addressing some concerns we had with a prior version of the bill. And again, we, we really appreciate that. This, this is a, 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 a bill that we can happily be neutral on. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Uh, opposition? Anyone in opposition? <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Israel Salas with San Diego Gas and Electric and certainly want to recognize uh, all of the amendments that the author has taken to the bill. Unfortunately, we, we must remain opposed to the bill. As we have said this year many of times and, and last year. We're, we're going to undo those amendments then. <laughs> we, we have, uh, SB 350 was very clear and it directed us to develop, it, to develop an integrated resource plan that we're uh, developing right now at the CPUC. We would like to see that process uh, play out. Uh, we, we oppose uh, this, this perpetuation of siloed procurement mandates that only lead to increased costs for, for our customers and reduces the flexibility that, that we would like to maintain to provide reliable, safe, and affordable service to our customers. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, okay. Yes, hi, Mr. Chair. Um, Valerie Terrell of Lajos Pacific Gas and Electric Company. And um, testifying today with a pose unless amended position, we did um, offer um, the author on the latest set of amendment, a uh, latest set the latest bill language, some amendments to just refine um, a couple words to uh, not uh, predetermine the outcome of the integrated resources planning process. A um, couple of uh, clarifications under uh, the directive to define a diverse and balanced portfolio of resources. But we did ask for the directive to consider a procurement mandate um, to be uh, stricken, and um, that is, as you've um, heard from my previous colleague, um, because you know we've seen language like this before, where like words used are like the word consider, and then we know that it is, ends up being a directive to the PUC, sort of the green light that we will see um, procurement mandates. Right now, PG&E has no need for um, renewable energy. Um, we are shedding load. Um, there's no need to um, procure. I want to speak to last year's um, events because um, I think they were referenced where there was um, a procurement mandate passed by this legislature. It was uh, directly related to a um, declaration of emergency. Those contracts were to be in no uh, longer duration of uh, five years. And um, it was um, a statewide solution to a statewide problem, and costs would be allocated fairly across all customers. So um, that is, it is one example, but I just wanted to clarify all of the circumstances um, where that, um, uh, where that um, occurred. So um, just in closing, just want to associate myself um, with uh, the previous, with my colleagues' comments previously, and just say that you know we do want to continue to work with the author. And I think some might think that the bill does nothing, but we do see, especially um, the directive, that the, the bill does do something at a time when we don't need to procure any new resources. Thank you. Hmm. You know, just interesting sitting here listening to that testimony. It just seems that we're all over the place on, on, on one minute we support procuring new and the next minute we don't. And then, uh, you know, we support uh, adding costs to deliver more electrification. Uh, we'll, we'll hear some bills later on that the utilities are advancing, uh, you know, that support. So it's just, it's very interesting that... Uh, 
when it comes to diversifying the par portfolio, that's something that we'll, that we'll get vehement opposition. And it's just, it just seems that in, in, in every sense of the word, if you're going to have a, an economy, you want a diversified economy. If you want a, a workforce, you want a diverse workforce. If you want anything, diversity makes sense. And I, I, I just believe that diversity makes sense in electricity just like it, it makes in, uh, you know, fuel source for automobiles. But um, it's no joke that I've, it's no joke, it's, it's no secret that I've, I've been working very hard to diversify the portfolio for many years for many reasons. Uh, there, are, there are economic benefits, there are environmental benefits, and, and I just want to applaud the author for, for advancing a cause that incorporates that approach statewide. It's, it's very exciting to see a bill that I think is very well thought out, that gets to issues that I think will unify the diverse interests and diverse needs of our state. We, we have a very diverse state, and, it, and it's hard as it's been to get people to agree on anything in this state. It's, it's, this is an area where I think we should agree because um, the deserts have different needs than the Central Valley, than the coast, than the north, and, and we have seen uh, northern and central legislators fi fi you know, fighting for biomass, and we've been working for geothermal where we have it, and we've been working for wind where we have it, and this just makes sense to uh, come up with, with this approach, which is new, which I think would be exciting at not only addressing our state's energy needs, but of also doing it in an in a environmentally friendly way that puts a premium on creating jobs in the state. And that's, that's very exciting for me to see, and I just want to thank you for leading this effort. This is a big bill. This is a huge bill, and it will make uh, an enormous uh, contribution to our state. This is a very beneficial bill, and I can see this being uh, a contributor. I mean, this is not going to solve all of our state's problems, but it, it will have a hand in solving diverse problems in every part of the state, and I think that's uh, just a brilliant way to, to legislate on our behalf, and I just want to... Thank you for doing that, and, and also thanking my colleague Eddie out there, who is my, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, ally in, in Imperial and Riverside counties, and and just wonderful work here. And I just wanted to uh, give a shout out to this bill that I support very much. And we have Senator Hertzberg that wants to add on his accolades as well. <laughs> I will invite him to, and then uh, Senator McGuire and anyone else, and then Senator Bradford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think that the point you make with respect to um, what's happening in the industry is a result of an age of disruption. We have a industrial complex built around fossil fuels, around natural gas. Certainly, we saw a lot of this during the energy crisis. I saw this, some of the couple of the familiar faces from those days, Mr. Smiley Jones. And the question becomes. How do we meet the various array of public policy challenges that we're facing? We're trying to figure out how we can create high-wage jobs in California, right, instead of importing assets, you know, so biofuels. We're looking at all sorts of other aspects of competing public policy areas, jobs, you know, the issues, certainly with other issues of waste and, and, and the biofuels and the ag waste and all of those issues. Geothermal, when we went down to, to, uh, to, to the shrinking salt and sea, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, uh, you know, we know that I heard it's 3,000 megawatts, and, and, and you look at the rate of employment in that area. You know, one of the ideas of solar business is you build it, and then you wipe it off every couple of months, and there's not much to do. Geothermal produces hundreds and hundreds of jobs. So when you try to create an integrated plan, there's kind of, it seems to me, there's a number of different public policy areas that we need to strengthen, uh, you know, the economic piece, all of those elements. And then in, it, in, it, in addition, um, this notion of baseload, basically the, the old model of renewables was, well, if the sun is shining in Palm Springs as it did during the energy crisis, we get 300 megawatts, or the wind is blowing, excuse me, we get 300 megawatts and we avoid a brownout. Well, today, you, you, with, with geothermal, with biofuels, you have an ability to create a baseload. 
So with a little bit of creative thinking, you can achieve so many of the objectives that we're trying to achieve in this republic of moving off of fossil fuels and moving toward a sustainable, job-creating, clean environment. So I, I do uh, uh, thank you for putting words in my mouth, but I agree with those words, Mr. Chairman, and I, I, I have accolades for the measure. I only want to make it stronger and guidance to the authors and co-authors to say, you know, uh, I, I make it tougher in the sense that let's charge ahead because these are, you know, the PUC has a limited role. The investor-owned utilities, well-run, limited role. Our role in this government is much broader than that, and we need to, t to tick as many of those boxes as possible, and this takes us down that road for a diversified base load and provide employment all across the state in a thoughtful way. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Uh, Senator McGuire. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Also want to say thank you to uh, Ms. Aguiar-Curry for her work and Mr. Garcia for uh, uh, all your work as well <clears throat> in bringing this forward. I think that you are focused on putting uh, those who are already working, and in particular some of our most impoverished areas in the state, I know where, uh, where we work together, uh, continue to be able to expand uh, desperately needed uh, opportunities to be able to assist our energy market. Just taking a look at biomass alone, and the dead and dying tree epidemic that we have here uh, in the Sierra and then on the Western Coastal Range. Um, it is one of the worst uh, epidemics that we've seen when it comes to forest health in the state. And in fact, I'll go back to what Ken Pimlot, chief of CAL FIRE said. It is uh, his biggest fear in his entire almost 40 year career is having these dead and dying trees and needing a market, particularly for yeah. biomass uh, in this state. And we have done uh, not nearly a, a good enough job of ensuring that we're putting people to work and taking those uh, dead and dying trees out of our forests. Um, and it's been a significant challenge. And then obviously on all issues of geothermal, uh, where um, you work so hard and uh, grateful to work with you, <clears throat> we have the largest plant in the world currently operating right now here in California. Uh, 750,000 homes every day, uh, and it's a pre-existing resource. So I just wanna say thank you, common sense, and appreciate all the hard work coming into this committee. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Assemblywoman Curry, for this measure. As an individual who worked for a utility company during the energy crisis, I know the importance of having a diverse portfolio, and I only wish it expanded more, not only in biomass, but bio-waste as well. Uh, it's no secret they burn trash in the Netherlands, and it's one of the cleanest, most efficient ways of generating power, only 25% of their waste ever makes it to a landfill. And uh, we have these facilities and they cannot get feedstock. I visited Weed, California, where there's a 200 megawatt plant up there and it can barely get tree, uh, feedstock despite the fact of uh, Senator McGuire stating that there's dead trees all throughout our forest that could easily power these plants. So this is a common sense measure. And when you always talk about ratepayer protection, I'm very much concerned, but I think we wouldn't be in the mix that we're in today if our RPS, the original one, wasn't as prescriptive as to defining what a renewable source is. And I think we're at a point where intermittent power is not where we need to be. We need to be base load power that's reliable, that we can turn on when our peak loads will shift, and uh, they are shifting. So again, I commend you for this bill, and I'm happy to be a co-author. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. I wanted to echo the comments of my colleagues that um, as we move towards a much larger percent of renewables in our uh, electricity mix, the broader the portfolio, that's a legitimate renewable portfolio. And so that broader portfolio, other re folks have referenced diverse, I think it's also great that it's not only diverse in terms of the source of the renewable, but where it's geographically located. And as we know, we do have areas of the state where some of our renewable resources that we've tended to rely on, are uh, there's not a lot of generation there now. So I appreciate the bill also, and I uh, want to just second to my colleagues' comments, and thank you for bringing it forward, and uh, I'll move the bill if there's not been a motion yet. Stern? Move the bill. Yes, okay, thank you. We'll, we'll move it soon. Just very briefly, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank uh, some members for bringing this forward. I was out in the Salton Sea. 
I saw the non-energy benefits that are being missed by the PUC's analysis and a bunch of kids out there with asthma walking around not being able to go to school. And you see it in our forests when you have wildfire risks that aren't accurately being accounted for. We've been trying for years. But I do want to say that I, I like your approach because the, the risk that I can see is that we get so prescriptive about how all this goes that you end up hitting all these different potential opportunities against each other. And I think the opportunity today is to come with that, that balance load. So I don't know if I'm on board with trash burning. Um, you should be. But <laughs> they, uh, they separate the gas, plastic gas. and um, <laughs> other uh, carcinogens and um, criteria air pollutants. Uh, prior to that, I'd be fine. I just want to make sure we keep an eye on our air quality and our climate goals while we're pursuing this. I like that you're using the IRP process because I still believe in that, and I think we ought to be having energy policy done in that integrated fashion. I just think this, this makes that integration truly complete. So thank you for bringing this forth. Thank you. Go to Sweden. Thank you. Uh, and we have a motion by uh, Senator Skinner. Yes, I, yeah, I'm getting there. We have a motion by Senator Skinner. Did you want to make some closing comments? Well, sure. Uh, thank you very much, and I appreciate all the comments. Um, AB 920 sends an important message to the CPUC and to all load serving entities that the procurement of base load renewables is critical and of the grid reliability and economic stability. But obviously the bill does not guarantee procure procurement of the resources. I think it's important for us to refine what a diverse renewable energy portfolio should look like. Nevertheless, I appreciate that some have concerns about 920 does not go far enough. I'm more than willing to continue this conversation and figure out how to strengthen this policy, and I ask for your eye vote. Thank you, and I just wanted to clarify, you proposed amendments, and I just wanted to, because they're, they're scheduled to be taken right. at this committee, and, and the bill does include amendments, so we have a motion with amendments. Uh, Senator Skinner? Yes. Okay. Clerk, please call the roll. Do you pass this amended to appropriations, Wesso? Aye. Wesso, aye. Morell? Aye. Morell, aye. Bradford? Aye. Bradford, aye. Canella? Aye. Canella, aye. Hertzberg? Aye. Hertzberg, aye. Hill? McGuire? Aye. McGuire, aye. Skinner? Aye. Skinner, aye. Stern? Aye. Stern, aye. Vidak? Aye. Vidak, aye. Wiener? Aye. Wiener, aye. 